hell yeah, he can do anything a spider can. Greetings fanboys and fangirls, I'm Erod and I'm the Blockbuster Buster. With Amazing Spider-Man hitting theaters this summer, I can't think of a better time to talk about what I believe to be the greatest Spider-Man cartoon to date. But before I get a hundred emails, a lot of you, and I do mean a lot of you, have asked me to talk about the 90s Spider-Man cartoon. So I'll go ahead and share my thoughts now. This is one of those shows that I loved as a kid, but I can't stand as an adult right along with the 1987 Ninja Turtles and the Super Friends. I respect that it has a strong fan base, and I agree that there were worse cartoons on at the time, but I still can't stand it. Let's talk about the good stuff first. I genuinely believe that the show had decent animation, and that it was a good representation of the early 90s Spider-Man universe, and that Spider-Man's dialogue for the most part was very funny. In fact, this was the second show I ever watched as a kid, which I saw every single episode as it aired. The other one was Rescue Rangers if you're curious. But anyway, all I'm saying is, believe me, I know the show really well. With that said, here are the things that repelled me. Number one, the focus. Yes, there were a few good stories here and there during its five year run. But the mass quantity of the time the focus of the show would go to a new villain that was being introduced or Spidey teaming up with another superhero, as opposed to focusing on his personal life and how it clashes with being a superhero. I swear, this show had more superhero team-ups than Justice League, and only a handful of them were any good. Number 2. The voice direction and the dialogue stinks. The characters over-enunciate, point out the obvious, and constantly state aloud what they're going to do before they do it. Spider-Man, for instance, can't shut the fuck up. His inner monologue goes on and on and on and on whether he needs to be talking or not. Quit griping, Parker. You know what's really bothering you. You're scared. This lizard creature is powerful enough to tear you limb from limb. But you can't even hurt him, because trapped inside is your friend. But I have to fight him. It's the only way to stop him, to save him. Well, isn't this the story of my life? Yes, I know. He has a lot of inner monologue in the comics, but it's a comic book. You need that to facilitate the story. Cartoons are a visual medium. Half of what he's babbling about could be established visually. Let's take Batman for example. Batman finds a clue, he just looks at it and goes, hmm. He doesn't go, gee golly willikers, this is the clue that's going to help me put the Joker in jail. In other words, Spidey, just shut the hell up and do it. And number three, and this is the worst offense of them all. The pacing in the show is horrible. Everything moves so fast shoving new concepts and new characters up your ass with such frequency that you never have time to digest it all. I remember that when I was a kid I always felt like I missed an episode, but the sad truth was that if I blinked or looked away for just a second I probably missed something. In conclusion, this is not the worst show and it's definitely a decent introduction into the Spidey universe, but I just feel that at the time with shows like X-Men, Batman, Gargoyles, and Pirates of Dark Water on the air, the animation world had matured and somehow Spidey's growth was stunned. A lot of you have asked me to share my thoughts about the new Ultimate Spider-Man cartoon. Well, as I'm recording this video, I've only seen two episodes and they were both terribly annoying. I really didn't care for all the breaking of the fourth wall, and I especially didn't care for them turning Luke Cage and Iron Fist into teenagers. It seems like they're desperately trying to be like Teen Titans. But, like I said, I've only seen two episodes, so I'm gonna give the show a chance and finish watching the season before I make a final decision as to whether I like it or I hate it. But so far, just by going by the first two episodes, I am not impressed. Alright, now let's move on to the show that did the webhead justice, Spectacular Spider-Man. Initially created to ride the lightning of the Spider-Man movie franchise, Spectacular Spider-Man was Gargoyles creator Greg Wiseman's love song to the Spideyverse, as it plays tribute to the Spider-Man comic book eras of the 60s and 70s, all the while giving the mythos a modern twist. The Plot for those of you who should be returning your geek cards, the show follows the adventures of Peter Parker, an average kid who gets amazing spider powers from the bite of a radioactive spider, and decides to employ them to fight crime under the guise of Spider-Man. This show, however, focuses on Peter's high school years, which are greatly skimmed over in the films and are never touched upon in the 90s cartoon. Cast and Characters this show has a lot of awesome characters, most of which are portrayed by veteran voiceover actors like Ray DeLeslie and Kevin Michael Richardson, or legendary genre actors like Clancy Brown and Robert Englund. So at the moment, I'm just going to concentrate on the two main characters. Peter Parker, aka Spider-Man, played by Josh Keaton. 
To me, Josh Keaton is to Spider-Man what Kevin Conroy is to Batman. He is the one actor who has given the character his definitive voice, going on to portray Spidey in video games and other media. Josh nails Spidey's youthful anxieties, as well as his fast-talking, smart-ass demeanor, making him my favorite actor to ever portray the webhead. Oh, that's not good. Now let's talk about my favorite character, Gwen Stacy, played by Lacey Shepard. For those of you who don't know, Gwen was Peter's first girlfriend in the comics, and sadly, she has become one of those underrated characters who they either omit from the adaptations, or they characterize her completely wrong. Here, we finally get the lovable nerdy girl from the comics brought to life, and we get to witness the progression of her relationship with Peter, from being friends to becoming a couple. <laughs> Move, D-Cat, or you're next! Please, you haven't got the game. If you could hit a target under pressure, would we have lost to Bronx Tech? You choke like a cat with a hairball. <laughs> animation and character design. Like all the other Marvel shows from this era, the animation is awesome. As far as I'm concerned, this is the only animated Spider-Man show to fully capture the motion and amazing agility of Spider-Man. The character design, however, is one of the few areas where this show falters. I remember a few of my friends initially refused to watch the show because they felt that the characters looked too soft and childish, like they were initially designed to be preschool toys. This usually doesn't bother me. I like clean, angular, stylized character design. However, I still feel like there were a few very poor choices made with some of the designs. Some characters, like Spider-Man, Vulture, Sandman, and Venom look awesome, and I especially like how they made Spidey's eyes look like Steve Ditko's original design. However, other characters like Dr. Octopus look like they belong in a Nick Jr. show. Okay, let's look at both ends of the spectrum. The best design and the worst design. The best design is Electro. Now this is a mass, mass improvement over the Mardi Gras mask and the yellow booties from the comics. The worst design is the Green Goblin. He just doesn't look like the Green Goblin. He doesn't look scary or creepy. He looks happy and lovable. He's not the Green Goblin. He's Jimmy the Happy Elf. Beware his hugging powers. And speaking of powerful things... Stanley Cameo! Behold! I am Mysterio, here to save the world from the evils of technology corrupting the human spirit. Are we being punk? I hate that. Silence, fool! Excelsior! Oh. Final verdict. Sadly, in spite of all of its inherent awesomeness, this show was still cancelled after just two seasons. Apparently, Greg Weissman tried to negotiate for a third season, but this was during the time of the Marvel merger with Disney. And because there were more pressing matters on the horizon, Spectacular Spider-Man got lost in the shuffle. You'd figure that an animated show based on one of the most popular superheroes on the planet would be money in the bank and worth preserving, but go figure. This show tops the rest for a simple reason. It puts the focus back where it belongs, a teenage boy who's still learning about life, trying to balance a dual identity. That is Spider-Man. The supervillains, the action, the superhero team-ups are all great essential parts of the Spider-Man formula, but they should always take a back seat to what really matters, the boy behind the mask. And that is what makes this show spectacular. 10 points on the badassitude meter. Oh, and the theme song's also pretty damn good. Aunt May, I'm not decent. <laughs> All right, calm down. There's breakfast waiting downstairs. I'll be at Mrs. Watson's. 